B N P is the topic for this video and BNP stands for brain type natriuretic peptide and sometimes it's referred to as B type natriuretic peptide so what is BNP it is essentially a blood test that is used to help diagnose congestive heart failure and congestive heart failure also has an abbreviation commonly known as CHF. So before I continue talking about BNP, I would like to talk a little bit about CHF. So here is a diagram of the heart, and I'll label these. Here is the inferior vena cava, superior vena cava. This is the right atrium. This is the left atrium. This is the right ventricle, left ventricle. This here is the pulmonary artery. This is the lungs, and this vessel here is the pulmonary vein, and this big one is the aorta. Now normally what happens is blood comes back to the heart, into the right atrium, it goes through these valves, into the pulmonary artery, becomes oxygenated, and then travels through the pulmonary vein to the left side of the heart, to the left atrium, into the left ventricle and eventually into the aorta. Now there's one valve I'd like to mention that covers the aorta called the aortic valve. And that opens and closes. So now I would like to mention two very important components of the cycle. The first is called diastole and the second is called systole. Diastole refers to the period where the heart is being filled with blood and in particular when the left ventricle is being filled with blood. So as blood is coming into the left ventricle blood is accumulating in that chamber and it gets up to a certain point. Then what happens is this aortic valve right here which was closed before now opens up and that allows blood to flow into the aorta. That phase is known as systole when blood is pumping into the aorta and eventually into the circulation. Now as blood starts going into the aorta it starts disappearing from the left ventricle of course and this cycle just keeps going on and on. So let's give some values here. Let's say at the end of diastole, your end diastolic volume, the amount of blood in the left ventricle at the end of diastole, is let's say 100 ml. Then the aortic valve opens and blood starts to come into the aorta and eventually you have most of the blood or if not most, at least some of the blood pumped out into the aorta. So then you have to look at the second value, which is end systolic volume. How much blood is left in the left ventricle at the end of systole? And let's say it's 40 mLs. So that means that 60 mLs went into the aorta. So that's fine. So in congestive heart failure, you have to figure out something called the ejection fraction. That will tell you if a person has congestive heart failure or not. And that is calculated as end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume divided by end diastolic volume. So if we go back to our example, our end diastolic volume was 100 and end systolic volume was 40. So this formula becomes 100 minus 40 over 100, which is 60 over 100, which is 60%. And the normal ejection fraction in a human is between 55 to 65%. So this patient does not have CHF. So let's look at another example. Let's say you have a patient that also has an end diastolic volume 
of 100. But when this aortic valve opens up and blood starts flowing into the aorta, 60 mLs does not go into the aorta, only say 30 mLs goes into the aorta. So that would mean that the end systolic volume, 70. Now why would this happen? The reason is because the patient is in congestive heart failure and what that really means is that the left ventricle simply is not strong enough to pump the blood into the aorta. It's a weak muscle. So if we go back to our formula, this number here is now 70, and that would make this 30, and that would be 30%. Congestive heart failure is defined as somebody who has an ejection fraction less than 50%. So this patient would indeed be in congestive heart failure. So going back to the diagram, if the patient is indeed in congestive heart failure, what happens? Well, there's so much more blood that is left behind in the left ventricle that blood actually starts to back up into the pulmonary vein. And this creates a big problem because fluid can then go into the lungs and into the extremities. So in CHF, blood backs up into the pulmonary vein. This causes fluid to go into the lungs and extremities. If fluid goes into the lung, it's known as pulmonary edema. And if fluid goes into the extremities, it's known as peripheral edema. And those are the patients that have the swollen feet and swollen lower extremities, the pitting edema. I'm sure you've seen that in the clinical setting. So now let's go back to our BNP, our B-type natriuretic peptide. Normal value for BNP is less than 100 PG per ml, and in CHF, it will be greater than 400. Now what's important to remember is that BNP can also be high in several other medical conditions. Renal failure, BNP can also be high in hypertension. It can be high in several pulmonary and cardiac diseases. It can also be high in older patients, in female patients, and patients with liver cirrhosis. Now what happens if the BNP value is, say, between 100 and 400? Well, in that case, you have to correlate the BNP value with the patient's symptoms and physical exam. So what exactly is BNP and why is it secreted? BNP is secreted by the muscle of the left ventricle in response to volume or pressure overload. So in particular, I'm talking about this muscle here, if this is the muscle wall this muscle will produce that BNP when there is CHF because a lot of blood is now accumulating in that chamber because the heart muscle is weak and is not able to pump as much blood into the aorta. So a lot more blood stays in the left ventricle and that creates an increase in volume and an increase in pressure. So that's great, but what is the purpose of this BNP being produced? This B-type natriuretic peptide, you may have deduced by now from the name natriuretic, helps to cause naturesis and diuresis. And what that means is that it helps the patient urinate out sodium and water. And this helps remove the excess fluid from the lungs and the extremities. And that helps naturally decrease the edema that can be caused by congestive heart failure. I wanted to mention in certain patients 
the BNP value can be falsely low or falsely high. So for example, in obese patients, the BNP value can be falsely low. So for example, let's say you have an obese patient with CHF and you would expect, say, a BNP value of 450. But instead of being 450, it will be falsely low. It will be, say, 300. So that creates a diagnostic challenge when assessing the patient. In contrast, you also have certain patients where the BNP value can be falsely high. And there's three that I wanted to mention. Sometimes in female patients, patients that are advanced in age, and patients that have renal failure. So for example, normal BNP value is less than 100. But in these patients, even if they do not have CHF, their BNP value can be higher. So it may be, let's say, 200, or maybe even higher, even though they do not have CHF. And that's what I mean by falsely high BNP values. So let's take a look now at a few clinical vignettes. A 56-year-old male with long-standing hypertension and a 30-pack year smoking history has a two-day history of dyspnea on exertion. A physical exam is unremarkable except for rare crackles at the bases of the lungs. Which one of the following serologic tests would be most helpful for detecting left ventricular dysfunction that is present in congestive heart failure? It's a great question. They're asking you, which blood test would you order to help with assessing the patient for possible congestive heart failure? And that test is, of course, BNP. An 86-year-old female presents to the emergency department with shortness of breath and a non-productive cough. On exam, she is slightly tachypneic, and tachycardic, but her temperature and blood pressure are normal. Bilateral crackles are noted on the pulmonary exam, but the cardiac exam is unremarkable. A chest x-ray shows bilateral fluffy infiltrates compatible with heart failure or pneumonia. A CBC, a CMP, and a troponin are normal. Her EKG shows sinus tachycardia. Which one of the following lab studies would be best to determine whether the patient should be treated for congestive heart failure. So again, very similar question, and all they're really looking for is BNP, which is choice B. And finally, you order a BNP level in a patient with symptoms and signs of heart failure. Which one of the following would contribute to a result that is higher than expected? So this question essentially is asking you, in what scenario would you have a falsely high value of BNP? And if you remember, there's three scenarios. There's female patients, there's patients that are advanced in age, and there's patients that have renal failure. So if you look at our answer choices, A is male sex, so it's not that one. Elevated BMI, that is referring to obesity, these patients actually have falsely low BNP levels. Patient of age 35, that's not really advanced age, but choice D, elevated creatinine, is what happens when you have renal failure. So the answer to this question is, is elevated creatinine.